Hello and welcome to Building the Premier Accounting Firm. I'm your host, Roger Connect, President of Universal Accounting Center, and this is a podcast dedicated to owners of bookkeeping, accounting, and tax businesses. It's here that we help you actually run those companies and be successful offering quality accounting services and most importantly, getting paid what you're worth. My guest today happens to be Mike Every. He's someone that I'm sure you're going to enjoy listening to because he's an entrepreneur and as a business owner has some excellent insights to us as we're actually running our own companies and helping build our thriving organization. So Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Roger. This is going to be an honor. So first of all, all of us have our journeys. All of us have what brings us to what we're doing. So tell us what it is that you do with Film Lab, but more importantly, how you came to this as an entrepreneur. Well, I man, I appreciate that. How, how I came to, to Film Lab and what Film Lab is, is we're a full-blown production company. So anything to do with a camera, we take care of. Um, we also manage podcasts make TV commercials and all, and all those things. And, and with this being a creative world, it, it really for myself kind of just fell into my lap. Um, you know, just knowing the right people and, and being able to pull a project together and make something beautiful and, and get to work with some really awesome, fun clients and have, and help support them with their dreams and their businesses. Very good. Now, I know in your previous life, you were also dealing with the finance and running some Paul Mitchell schools. And I bring that up because of the finance side of it, the numbers and running the company. That's what's going to, going to relate to my audience being accounting professionals. So I'm curious, before we get into some of your leadership philosophies and so forth, what is it that numbers bring to running a business? Numbers tell the story. Um, and they also are able to give you a plan. And my job prior to Film Lab is uh, I was a VP of Finance and Operations for the Paul Mitchell Schools. So there were seven different campuses that I covered between Utah, Idaho, and Washington. And uh, having them, you know, all act independently, it was a franchise, um, being able to set goals, budgets, or, you know, oversee ordering. Um, it's it's a lot, and the numbers tell everything. I love how you said tell the story because we refer to it as the language of business, and yep. what it's trying to communicate is that story, and we're hoping that the narrative that we're seeing in the numbers relates or corresponds to what people are experiencing as they're running the companies. Yep. So when you were running the business and overseeing those fr those franchises, what were some of those metrics or numbers that you were paying attention to? Um, the um, As far as... Uh, um, with it being a school, revenue wasn't our main objective. Um, my main number that I would focus on was guests per future professional. Uh, that's what we call our students because we are imagining them. We're thinking of them as a future professional. And that number, because they obviously we have guests that will come in and pay for a really cheap haircut because <laughs> okay. they're a student, right? Um, and I'm bald, so they don't get a lot of practice on me, but I got a beard. So, But uh, that was the most important number to me was I wanted my students to be as busy as possible because practice makes makes you better. That's how you learn. That's how you make mistakes, and that's how you move forward. And that's one that we would track aggressively. And and I understood if our students were were learning and were busy with guests, they were getting the education that they should be getting. I love it because what I would refer to that as is a leading indicator. That leading indicator is that metric we're watching that if we hit it, we know the lagging indicators will follow. Yep. And hence, when we run and prepare those financial reports, we'll see what we expect because we knew what was, what was happening long before we calculated those final numbers. So the leading indicator, as you're, in, as you're mentioning with the guests, was key to the success. If you miss those, there was no surprise later on that you were missing all the other markers. 100%. Yeah, very good. All right, so let's talk about your journey into entrepreneurship. When I'm speaking to the people that I speak with, I refer to them as a counterpreneurs simply because it's the mix of accounting and <laughs> entrepreneurism. Yeah. But it's a special breed, right? So why go out and start your own business and get involved with Film Lab? So with Film Lab, uh, um, honestly, for, for me, it was an opportunity to a big career change for me. Um, you know, prior to Paul Mitchell, I worked for Costco for seven years, worked at a warehouse that did 320 million in revenue just at that one warehouse, 350 employees. And, uh, and, and when I worked there in some form at Paul Mitchell, it didn't feel like I made, you know, that big of an impact. Just obviously it's just a, it's a bigger business. It's a bigger company. Yeah. Um, and when I had the opportunity to come on at, at film lab, it's, it's a startup. I mean, we're, we're about two years old. And uh, we we backed it ourselves. We we've gutted it. We've we've learned. We've adapted, and that's how I kind of came to just trying something new. And also my business partner Mitch, um, I he he's the creative one. I handle all the uh, the 
boring things of business, which I don't find it boring looking yeah. at spreadsheets and and uh, making plans and taking care of and solving problems. But um, everyone else on the team is the creative. They're the ones that know how to use a camera. They know how to edit. They know how to record podcasts and take care of uh, that creative build side. So I take care of the accounting, the HR, the 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 finance operations, the sales of everything for Film Lab. So how much of your business revolve, revolves around the numbers? How often are you looking at the numbers as you're building the organization? Every day. Every day. Yeah. I like that. So let's talk about then your philosophy as it relates to business. We were talking earlier about leadership and mission statements. Let's talk about the mission statements to begin there. What's a mission statement? Why should it matter? It's kind of an old 90-ism mm-hmm. kind of a thing. Uh, we have a mission statement, coincidentally, Ooh. and it's it's something that we adhere to. I can give a little bit of history to yeah, ours. absolutely. Go for it. But uh, no, I want to start with yours. Your, what's your <laughs> philosophy on mission statements? And then I'll share mine. Yeah, mission statements uh, for me, it, it's it's your foundation. It's your basic understanding of what you're there to achieve and what you're what you're there to accomplish. And I think it applies not only to businesses, but to personal lives as well. So like at Costco, um, you know, their their mission statement is to continually provide quality goods and services at the lowest possible price. Um, at Paul Mitchell, it was when people come first, success will follow. Uh, for my own personal family, um, and I say this with my with my family almost every day before I go to work. And, and, and it's very simple. And I have four kids and they're 10, seven, four and 18 months. And my four-year-old, like, <laughs> you know, he's been saying it since he was like two and a half. And it's just all, all that it is. It's just, I am brave, honest, and kind. I'm a friend to everyone and I can do hard things. Oh, I love that. And, and part of the reason why I love mission statements and I'll share a story about my daughter, Evelyn, um, you know, she's on a competitive dance team. And this is probably three years ago. So she was she was seven. And this is her first time going on stage. And she is so nervous that she is locked. Like she just can't do it. She can't move forward. She's uh she's she's just frozen. And uh and I just sat with her at her level and just repeated our our mission statement, our family slogan, whatever you want to call it, and just say, hey, Evelyn, can you can you do hard things? Yeah, I can do hard things. <laughs> Can, are you are you brave? Yeah, I'm I'm brave, and just again repeated that, repeated that, and uh, and she she was able to overcome those fears, f- being able to fall back on that understanding and that belief of if she is she is honest, she is brave, she is kind, and she can do hard things. And so sure enough, she went up there and just did an amazing job in this dance competition. Uh, it was actually kind of funny. She had kicked herself in the face, but <laughs> but she didn't skip a beat. She kept on going, and and I've uh, I've just always remembered that. Um, and when I would, you know, with my teams at Paul Mitchell or Film Lab or Costco, we would always try to fall back on the main purpose of our job, which was the mission statement. So I'm finding this fascinating because obviously, having worked for Costco and then Paul Mitchell, they would have had it as perhaps their their uh, corporate culture, and I'm sure it was developed in some mastermind meeting of some sorts. But at a family level, this is either you, your wife, both of you realizing we need to instill this with our children. Why did you bring it to the family level? Um, I think uh, in having a, a, of an understanding of what you believe in and what you stand for um, in today's world is, is extremely important. Very much. Agree. And so, and so it's in, and even nowadays it's, it's hard to express that to younger kids. And so just from the beginning, being able to let them know what it means to be in every or, you know, what it means to be in our household or in our family, um, just teaching them the very basics of what we do and what we who we are. Yeah. So when you were kind of sharing what your son was saying, I would say that's more akin to an affirmation. So what would, what in your mind is different between an affirmation and a mission statement? That's a good question, Roger. <laughs> um. I think a, a mission statement is is probably more directed towards um, a culture okay. or or an understanding of uh, of a company or a group of people's belief. And affirmation is more general. Okay. So in my mind, just kind of elaborating here, a mission statement is more of a purpose. It's this yeah. is where we're driven. This is what we're doing. It's our objective. Mm-hmm. And affirmation is more of a char- character definition. It's who am I? Yeah. It's present tense, even though it might be futuristic characteristics. It's 
said in the present tense so that you're mentally kind of adopting who you want to be, even though you may not be there yet. Um, you can speak of skill sets and so forth as if you've already acquired them. And that affirmation is very affirming yeah. in the mind because it's it's that inner voice telling you you can do something. Yeah. Hugely powerful. Online, there's a number of these YouTube or Reels and so forth where these young children are just using these powerful inf- powerful affirmations that really attest to who they are, but you can clearly tell who they're going to be. Yep. I love that. And and one of the reasons I also love that mission statement is like we were talking earlier, how I focused on the one number and everything below it just falls suit. Yeah. And I feel the same with mission statements. If we focused on that, everything below that for the most part follows suit as well. And so when I was at Costco and I would be doing um, interviews for management or supervisor positions for Uh people that applied, the first question I would ask is what is Costco's mission statement? And if they didn't know, I would stop the interview. <laughs> and I would say, you know, with this being a leadership position, you need to know and understand what Costco's mission statement is. Powerful. And so, and, uh, and that upset a lot of people because <laughs> believe it or not, a majority of people wouldn't know that question. And I told them I would interview them again, but I needed them to know and understand why that was so crucial and so important, especially being in a leadership position. And, uh, and later down the road, you know, I actually had several people thank me for, for being that blunt of just stopping the interview, explaining to them why it's so important to understand what team, what we believe in for our team. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I don't regret it at all. Like I said, there's a lot of people mad and, but at the end of the day, it always came out for the positive and we were able to just revolutionize the culture at our, at our one location based on that. Wow. That, you know, I can really relate to that. Not that I've experienced that. But when you're actually in a working in, you know, like a W-2 in, uh, in a situation, let's say, you're actually taking your time, your efforts, your skills, and you're offering them in exchange for compensation. Yeah. And if you're going to represent that entity organization, you're going to do so per their mission statement, what they are about. That's what they're paying you to do. Yeah. And I would agree in a leadership role, you're in a situation where they're expecting you to adhere to what it is they've basically identified or subscribed to. Mm-hmm. So how could you be interviewed for or manage other individuals when you're not clear as to the mission or purpose of the company? Correct. Just I, spot on. I totally yeah. get it. Well, and, and at the end of the day, they probably want to make more money. Yeah. And and I, and I understand that, but when you, a leadership there's a clear difference between a leader and a manager. Uh-huh. And, uh, and, and I wanted, I wanted leaders, not managers. Very, very good. All right. So um, as for the mission statement, the other thing I would add is in our case, I view, view them very much like bumper pads in a bowling alley, bowling alley. They can be moved in the sense of the width and so forth, but they are directional. They are meant to help us move in a specific direction with mm-hmm. a pr- particular purpose and aim. And so uh, we've had instances where, in our mission statement, we've clearly identified things and we've, in hindsight, recognized that we're starting to deviate from that. And we had to ask ourselves the question, is this deviation something that's intentional that we need to move the entire company towards and admit that our mission statement is lacking and needs to be updated? Or are we going to adhere to what we've already agreed to and now realign ourselves? Yeah, Something has to happen because we're saying we're going this way and we're moving this direction. One of the two have to change because we're not in alignment. And so I like the fact that you're able to reassess that. So here's my experience with a mission statement. I'm curious how you might have seen them evolve over time. Not that I expect that you were involved with Costco's or Paul Mitchell's, mm-hmm. but definitely you were involved with your own family. And it's we wrote ours in a management meeting. We had a retreat and wrote the mission statement, drafted basically as a group what we felt it was, And then before announcing it to the company, we shelved it for a year. And in that year, we just ran the business and we looked back after the year at the decisions we made and we felt, did we organically, naturally move in alignment to what we said we were doing or were we off? In other words, are we naturally now in alignment with what we're doing? And if the mission statement represented what we did in that year, we felt good that it's on, it's the, the direction of where we're headed. And we made some adjustments and, and kind of refined it. And then we declared it to the company. And ever since then, it's kind of adhered to what it is. And we have a mission statement. 
Do you have anything similar to that as your experience in drafting and coming up with one? I I love that. That's a great idea to to shelf it just to to I guess think about it, ponder it, um, and and it makes it really genuine that you did that. Uh, makes it really it, the team understood when when you probably came out with that. It probably wasn't a surprise <laughs> to, to your team, you know, or the company. It was uh-huh. like, oh no, this th- this is e- extremely lined up with what we stand for and what we believe. So I love that idea. Yeah. Um, yeah so with uh, with Paul Mitchell, um, I, I didn't come up with the you know when people come first, successful follow, but with with our with our seven campuses, um, you know, being able to just build upon it and develop it and live it every single day. Um, and, and your actions when you're making decisions. Um, and, and those can just add, add up to the smaller things of, you know, putting fresh paint on the wall or, you know, buying your team the right tools they need to be successful. Um, how to develop, you know, the, the proper form of delivering that mission statement as well of just making sure it's genuine and people believe in it. So one of the things that I think my listeners will appreciate is the fact that what we're talking about here is once you become very clear on your purpose, your objective, Simon Sinek would say your why, mm-hmm. all of a sudden that clarity allows all the decisions that you're making kind of hone in on that one objective. Yeah. And if you're actually focused on the right key metric, everything else will follow as you've indicated. And so what you can really quickly determine is if you focused on that and you're not achieving what you wanted, then obviously you've got the wrong objective in mind. And so you yep. can now adapt and go, that's not the case. And I've seen that happen in compensation plans, mm-hmm. uh, actually a number of times where management comes in, puts an incentive, a bonus on a particular activity, presuming that it's going to result in what they want. And it turns out that the salespeople being creative will actually hit the objective that's been given, the bonus that's out there. And if it's not correct, you'll actually be paying and motivating people to do something that's counter to the goal. Yep. And I've seen that time and again. And so at the end of the day, we've over the years refined in our organization a key metric for every employee believing if they just did this one thing, that con- contribution to the company's success means we will be successful. And if that one person misses that key metric, then something's going to fall apart. Yeah. And uh, that clarity as to what that metric is, I think is one of the telltale reasons of the successes we've experienced. Yep. So. And and uh, it takes time to find that right metric. It and it's different for every company. Yes. And majority of the times, it's probably not going to be overall revenue, <laughs> profit, EBITDA, whatever. Like, it's probably not going to be one of those. Um, but you're going to have to find what that is. And, and I think the best way to find that is to get curious and ask the entire team. Um, I think getting input of people that, um, are doing the lower level jobs mm-hmm. goes such a far way of under, of understanding what the main objective or goal is of being what they go through and what their main goal or focus is. Yeah. Well, I refer to it as a leading indicator. Yeah. To focus on lagging indicators or the accounting, most of the employees don't have access to the accounting numbers. Yeah. The lagging number is so past, it's so old in the process that if you're focused on it, you might miss things that are early on indications of success or failure. You can't adapt quick enough if it's a lagging indicator. So I always emphasize the leading indicators, like you were saying with the guests at Paul Mitchell. Yeah. If that falls into place, if you have the guests coming in and people are busy and working, everything else should fall in line. So if we make that experience, that training, the tools, as you were indicating, all those things fall into place that that individual is then going to be successful with the thing that matters most. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So the next thing, leadership. Um, I know culture was the thing that you brought up earlier. What would you say about leadership, culture? You were talking about leaders being leaders different than managers. What would you want to add there? I, uh, I love, I love talking about leadership um, and comparing it to management because I I do feel they're very different things. When I think of management, I think of, of a similar definition of what I think of businesses. All businesses is, a form of small tasks done in an organized fashion. Okay. And and I can hire a manager to oversee those tasks for me. That's pretty easy. Um, but I need a leader to guide the team to solve problems and to take care of people. And I think uh, I think the most important factor for for a leader is to 
their their main job i i would i want 50 percent of their job focused on the team like de- developing them building them shoulder to shoulder um, one-on-one if possible um, with clear direction of of how can i support you to accomplish your job and i think if we if if everyone just we're able to dedicate that time to a factor like that. Those employees are going to feel a lot more valued, a lot more heard, and they're going to have a, even a more clear vision of what the culture is and what the main objective is as well. So I'm going to share with you something that I've learned over the years and tried to implement, and I'm going to see if this correlates with what you're talking about. The three kind of levels of a company, you've got the employees, the doers, Mm -hmm. you've got the managers, and then you've got the leaders, okay, the executives and so forth. And the way it was defined in in the training I've had and what we've implemented implemented is that the doer, the employee who's involved in the day-to-day operations, 80 to 90% of their efforts and time needed to be devoted to the task at hand with maybe 10 to 20 percent of how can they maybe improve those processes maybe do it differently or better maybe get trained but it's basically them doing the work yeah managers about 50 50. you've got to know what's going on how it's happening so that you're intimately aware of the processes but 50 percent of the time is how do we do this better more efficiently how do we improve the processes whether it's tools or training and uh, kind of motivating the employees, attentive to what those needs are. So it's a 50-50. They've got to be in the work doing it, but they've got to have enough time outside of the work to assess and analyze. But the leaders, it's more of a maybe 10% of the time in the day-to-day operations. It's more 80-90% of the time in the visionary, planning for the future, where are we going with this, how do we adapt to changes outside circumstances, how do we remain relevant, and it's that leadership, that visionary type role that is looking at the culture. It's looking at basically capital and it's assessing what needs to happen in the business. How, what would you add to that and what would you elaborate on? I uh, I agree with everything you just said. I, th- I thought that was put perfectly. Um, I th- I don't think there's anything I'd add to that. I think that All was right. just spot on. That was like... Just, Let there be perfection. Yeah, then. right? That was that was great. I think just the importance of dividing in and understanding each other's roles and um, and I think with that leadership, it really, um, with, with that mission statement, like you mentioned, like culture, culture is so crucial to, to a company's, uh, success and being able to uphold its mission statement. And I always, I would always, always would kind of make the joke that culture is something that controls the chaos. Yeah. <laughs> and cause, cause you always, um, default to what you know and what you do. And if someone understood that mission statement, which means hopefully they understand what that culture is, and at the end of the day, we're going to do the right thing type of time or type of uh, mind frame. Well, what we have in our company is a thing that's called STAR. It's building an, a, a culture of accountability, mm-hmm. and STAR is an acronym. And what we do with this is really kind of help our people realize what they can be doing in their role and what they do in their uh, capacity. And when it comes to the employee, what we focus on are three T's. It's tools, training, temperament. And with tools, we want to make sure that we've given them the technology, the means to actually accomplish the job. So uh, it might be a software program, you know, a, a phone system, a headset. It's just anything and everything that they need to do their job. And there's no excuse because everything that they have works. Yeah. But at the same time, the training. It's one thing to give them the tool, but if they don't have the means, the know-how to use it properly and effectively, efficiently, then we've not enabled them to be successful. Yes, I put in front of them this tool, but I never showed them how to log into it, how to utilize it on the computer, whatever the case may be. I just presumed they knew how to use it. Well, I can't presume anything. And I start with the basics. And there was a story that I remember regarding uh, basketball, and I don't remember who. I'm sure somebody that's in athletics would recall this story better than I, but it was this uh, coach, and I believe it was with the NBA, uh, might have been college, but the point is, is his first day of the season, he started training by going over how to put on the socks. And here these players are, ones that have played in high school, perhaps college, maybe it was a college coach, but the point is, is they've put on socks, like all of us, every day of their lives practically. And yet he realized that if they were not putting their socks on correctly, they run the risk of actually getting blisters, 
and foot sores, and that would inhibit their ability to be successful on the floor. So he knew that he needed to start with the basics. Yeah. And so he instructed them on, this is how you put on a sock. And by doing this correctly, you would take care of your feet. And I thought that was fascinating to take the most obvious thing and still focus on it. So in our culture, it's tools, training, and temperament. Well, with tools, we've given them the resources they need. Training, we've empowered them, hopefully, with the means to do this conf confidently. But it's the temperament that they bring from the outside. Yeah. The temperament is, do the, you know, I could have brought in attitude, but it wasn't a T, right? <laughs> but, but there's so much to be said with someone's mental state when they come into work. And so many people, unfortunately, deal with drama. They uh, have a victim mentality. They bring to the work outside things that are irrelevant to the employment, but yet they feel that these are things that matter. And what we need to do is try and manage those things and help them understand some of these things are not welcome in the work environment. And uh, this is what we're doing when we're here. We're not gossiping. We're not talking about this. We're going to work. And the best way I can describe that is I've had individuals who have in their lives so much chaos and they're frustrated outside at home and i say look i realize that life is difficult and you're dealing with some things i would like to think that work is a refuge for yeah. you i'd like to think that when you come here you are so good at what you do that you can escape into that success and get the accolades the praises for the work well done forgetting about or kind of escaping from the chaos that you're dealing with outside of work so please come here, be successful, and let's provide for you an environment where you can excel and be happy because you're good at what you do. And let's not bring those things that are going on outside in here because neither you nor I can do anything about them. Mm -hmm. And in so many instances, that conversation has been so helpful to individuals because they realized they didn't need to bring the outside in and they could focus on what they do and do it better. And they really start focusing on what they're doing and are good at and start to experience happiness here at work. And they escape, yeah. and that's beautiful. So what would you add to that? I think it's important to um, recognize that they're, when employees come to work, I've, everyone has issues. You know, Everyone's got their own problems. Um, but having, having a culture of understanding, like you were kind of just describing, of being able to have honest conversations with, with your team um, and, and have your team really know that you care <laughs> goes so far. Um, I, I mean, in, in all the leadership roles that I've had, I, I've been able to, you know, play a, a mentor role in some form, you oh, know, yeah. a friend of just being able to give people um, advice because people don't know what they don't know. And when it's your own situation, you it's it's harder to to really break down um, the situation of being able to how to solve it or because um, it's really close to home. And and having a friend and having a leader or a manager that really truly cares about you, I think really goes a long way of being able to support and see someone through those those hard times. Yeah. So for my listeners, I think this is something that's really important to, to mention. I dare say 99.9% .9 of my listeners are in organizations that have fewer than 50 employees. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they're not at that role where, or that size where they would have the HR role filled in the, in the company. So whether they're solopreneurs or they have small staff, there's a lot of personal conversations that typically will come up. And what we don't realize is many of us, especially in management or leadership roles, do become counselors. We become marriage counselors, life counselors. Yeah. Uh, you, you just start dealing with a lot of things because in so many ways, they don't have parental guidance. They don't have friends. And you can, if, if done healthily, you can actually provide some of that outside support when appropriate. And I think I've not think, I know I've had many conversations that range from parenting to life skills to uh, marital relationships. Those conversations are ones that naturally come up, but they shouldn't distract from the work. We all have purposes and we're getting paid to do a job. And so there's that balance that goes on there. But it's nice to be able to give people that sense of we care, we're interested, we're, we're wanting you to be, you know, happy and healthy. So there's that balance that we need yeah. to kind of bring to the table. So would you have any other leadership advice that you'd want to mention? Yeah, I think I'd want to mention that um, I would ask a lot of questions. Um, and I would never assume you know what's best. And, and I would always give people the benefit of the doubt that they're doing their best and they want to do the right thing. They just don't know which direction maybe. 
<laughs> All right. So that actually brings up something that I was lear- uh, taught when I was early in my management training at another company, and it was presuppositions. And you actually almost quoted one verbatim, and it's presumed that people make the best choice available to them. Yeah. And what that's meant to say is they may not have made the same choice you would have, and they may not have even made the right choice, which you might think is clear mm-hmm. and, and dry, but they did see for themselves options and they chose the best one that they believed was available to them. Well, that changes how you interact with people because you don't then presume that they're unaware or stupid or whatever the word we might want to use. We're able to recognize that they did the best they could in the situation at hand. Yeah. And assuming positive intent is an extension of that. Positive intent is to get away from believing that everyone is calculative and manipulative and, uh, uh, evil in that sense, not to say they don't exist. They clearly do exist in the world, but to go around in life, especially in business, presuming that everyone else is sabotaging everything around you is a toxic way of living in a business setting. And so if you have those people, get rid of them, but you should be able to trust everyone you're working with that you all have the same objective at hand. So uh, from a leadership perspective, those presuppositions that I was taught, those were game changers because they clearly affected how I perceived the world around me and how I interacted with it. And yeah. those presuppositions were hugely important in my yeah. life. And one thing that's helped me uh, with asking questions is if I if I know I'm going to have a difficult conversation with an employee, I always like to say, "Hey, so and so, I'm coming in asking. <laughs> uh-huh. Like I'm I I want to come in and ask questions because this is this is what happened." this was my perspective. Is this correct? Um, and when I've come from that perspective, um, and, and I've even expressed where, you know, if it's a really difficult conversation, just saying, Hey, I honestly don't know how to say this. This is what I observed though. This is what I heard. Is this true? Is this accurate? Um, and cause if you come in just pointing a finger and blaming that that person is not going to feel safe, they're going to feel on defense 100%. And I think being able to just come in asking really opens the door to have a, a natural flow and connection with that person, which at the end of the day, that's the most important thing. Yeah, you actually said two key things there. One, the safe environment, and that second, asking questions. It relates to both the employees as we're talking today, but as I've shared numerous times with, with my listeners, when doing CFO and advisory work, it also extends into the consultative conversations we're having with our clients. When we're coaching our clients, they're not expecting that. Well, maybe they are expecting, but they're not going to get from us necessarily the answers. They're going to get the right questions. The belief is is that the individual actually has within themselves the answers. Mm -hmm. They know what's best for themselves. What they oftentimes lack is the ability to kind of think out loud or process the information to come to those conclusions. And so, like you're mentioning, asking the right questions really is a good uh, principle that you get from counseling. Counseling is never meant to be telling people what they should be doing. It's rather helping people process what their feelings and emotions are to where they come to their conclusion. They can own it now. It was yeah. their decision, and now they can run with it because they came up with it. And so I think what you're sharing there is in that premise. We're not trying to tell people what to do. We're just there to ask questions and help them process exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, and I love I love what you said because we really are, we're there to empower them yes. of how to solve their own problems, not solve it for them. Yeah, good lessons learned. All right, so um, one thing that I failed to share earlier, and I was, I was wanting to circle back to this, uh, you were talking about your family having a mission statement and so forth. I wanted to mention what I believe my kids would say because I've said it for years and I'm hoping that they would say the same thing, <laughs> is uh, we always say families first. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've been very uh, p- passionate about is family comes first. And if there's something going on where family is needed, we're there. Yeah. And I really do want, and it's not just at the 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 uh, family cell, it's the extended family as well with uh, aunts, uncles, cousins. We, we want them to believe that we all are a network that we can lean on one another. And as my children have gotten older, moved out, each gotten married, I'm seeing that they do feel more confident because they're not alone in the world. They have someone that they can lean back on. And numerous times, my children have come to either my wife or me for counsel. They've come to us for advice. They've come to us for support, where if they felt they needed something, they're comfortable asking for it. And I think that's hugely important in today's world 
for individuals to feel that they've got a network that they can lean on, family or friends, that they're not going to struggle out there. And I was listening to a recent uh, podcast by uh, Dennis Prager where he was talking about suicide. Mm -hmm. And this is something I've experienced having worked with individuals who are suicidal. And there's two things that really play into it, a sense of loneliness and the, the sense of they don't have purpose or meaning. Those two things creep into someone's life, and then all of a sudden they start to doubt who they are in their, in their essence of being. And so whenever we as leaders can help empower people to know they're not alone, that we're all in this together to be successful, and they have purpose, they, they actually play an integral role in the success of the business, how powerful is that to give someone the identity of, I have purpose, I have meaning, I'm with someone else, I'm part of something bigger than myself. Love that. That's huge. It is massive. I love that. Yeah. Family first. That's, uh, I mean, and it's, I, I, that's really cool to see it now, like with older kids. Uh -huh. And I'm, I'm really excited for, for when my kids are older to see if they retain that, that understanding or, yeah. or that, that meaning. And so, cause I know obviously, you know, Costco and Paul Mitchell and, um, Film Lab is all stuck with me of, of what it's been able to be. And it helped support me make decisions for the company. And uh, and because the default of what I want to do is take care of people and and be there for them to support them. Yeah. Well, I do believe your children being as young as they are, they're already experiencing the, the success of what you're teaching them mm -hmm. because they're not going to feel alone. And although they may not fit in somewhere, they know they do fit in somewhere. Correct. And I think it's very empowering for them. My children, uh, I, I look at them and they're they're making great decisions. They are not that I've done anything to it. Yeah, they are. They're great people, but I believe it comes from the confidence that they've along the way kind of acquired in themselves and in the group that they have around them. So that's very powerful. All right. So here's where I want to go next. We've talked about leadership. We talked about mission statements. We talked about culture. What other elements do you feel are essential for an organization to be successful? Because from an accounting perspective, we started with numbers. Mm -hmm. What numbers do you look at in the business? You're kind of in the financial world. How valuable is the accounting to what you do? Um, the accounting, it, it's honestly the, the, the bloodstream of any, of any company. I mean, if you, if you don't have sales or you don't have revenue, you don't have a business. And, and I think with Film Lab, what um that was one thing when i first joined um obviously film lab was um was really new then um they they had no system of you know what do we charge and and in the video world it's actually extremely hard to know what to charge for a commercial because every company's needs are are different and that's where i would say um it's very very important to know the difference between marketing and branding and we can talk about that later but as far as for Film Lab, um, having structure to how our processes work of how we do sales, how we do marketing, how we do um, bid projects out, how do we gain leads, how do we talk to guests, how do we follow up with guests, having having structure to that and be able to follow those numbers of in an organized fashion of saying, hey, I've got to talk to this person, follow up with this person, or i got to send this proposal, or I've got to pay this bill or whatnot. It's, you've got to manage that. Very good. Do you have any advice for the accounting profession? Um, as far as managing the Just finance sides that or, or tax or, you know, the bookkeeping accounting side of things. Yeah. I, I would say don't, don't put it off and do it every week. I know when I talk to people, they won't reconcile or do things for like months and months and months. And, and I think uh, doing a small amount of it every single week saves you a lot of headaches later down the road when tax season comes up or or when you are reconciling that business and you're able to catch things. Um, I know like when I first started with a film lab and, and was diving into past uh, contracts and invoices, I found found over $12,000 worth of, of payments that no one knew about oh, wow. <laughs> that were owed to us from jobs that we had done. But Someone just simply forgot to send an invoice. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and I there's not many companies that will just freely send you money for for no reason <laughs> unless you're asking sure. for it. So um, that was a lot of lot of fun, just really being able to dive into things and and f again fall on those systems and processes and correct it. You know, you bring up accounts receivable. I think it's very important from a 
from a CFO point of view to come in and put in place those processes to ensure that we're managing the receivables effectively. There's a lot of business owners as they run their companies who know that there's a an invoice out there that there's money's owed and in their mind, they'll eventually get the money. So they're confident that the funds will come in. But as the age, the likelihood of those monies coming through diminishes greatly. In yeah. fact, one of the things that's very difficult is at the time of the service or product, it was likely you would have been paid if you just would have invoiced it because by invoicing it, the the recipient, the cu- customer, knew that they had just gotten the product or service and they intended to pay. Yeah. But when you don't invoice them, over a period of time, those funds that they had get spent elsewhere. Yeah. And so when you come on the scene 30, 60, 90, 120 days later saying, oh, by the way, you owe us for this, they may no longer have the funds available to pay you because what they had set aside is now spent and gone elsewhere. And now there's a pickle going on. You don't know what the status of that business is at that time. And yeah. they might be in a different circumstance or situation that they no longer have the funds to be able to pay you. But yet you're working from the premise of, well, I did it and they owe me. If I just ask, they'll give it to me. So I've been busy. I haven't had time. So <laughs> 90 days later, 120 day, yeah. days later, I asked for it. And voila, I'm expecting to be paid. And I think really establishing those accounts receivables processes in a business further ensure you're going to have the company get paid for the services or products products uh, produced and rendered. But more importantly, you're going to decrease what you end up writing off, going to collections. You simplify the system. Yep. Lots to be said. So I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. And what we do at Film Lab to ensure that doesn't ever happen again is when we send clients contracts, even before I send the contract, I find out who who's the right person that actually pays the bills. Because I know majority of the times the person I'm talking to is not is not handling that factor. And then two, I have a very clear conversation of, let's say this project is, you know, $50,000. It's going to take us four weeks to complete. I'll have that conversation of saying, Hey, look, half is the deposit and this will be, this will be paid on this day. And then the other half is due 30 days later on this day. Are these dates correct? <laughs> and and I love breaking it down like that because when I am talking to the person that handles the accounting for whatever company I'm working with, that's how they their mind thinks too. <laughs> and like you mentioned, they can budget for that. Yeah. Um. It's they can't budget for just some random invoice that they were never planning for because it was never communicated to them. So having a clear understanding of when when things should be paid with a client, even before you sign a contract and start work, and I will write that into the contract. So this amount is due on this day. <laughs> this amount is due on this day, you know, depending on however long the contract yeah. is. Just so, again, that doesn't bring up any awkward conversations. And and I can simply just refer back to the contract that we all agreed upon. We all signed. And if they, again, are having trouble times or whatnot, at least they understand, hey, this was agreed upon and, and you agreed to pay it this amount at this day. Yeah, what you're describing are the CFO mindsets. Yeah. <laughs> let's get into the particulars of the process and the timing of everything. Um, I like that. I like that a lot because I think that's something that is underutilized in most businesses. There's a lot of good faith, a lot of uh, handshakes, and all those things are wonderful, except for the fact that they're not clear. Yeah. There's ambiguity. And what we want to have is that specificity. Good. All right. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kind of wrap this up and I'm going to come back to you for a closing thought and see uh, what you'd like to end with. But for my listeners, I just want to mention that in the episode description, there's going to be some information there that I would encourage you to check out. One of the things that we were discussing today is uh, basically referred to as our STAR program. The STAR program is a culture of accountability that we take to our clients to actually help them understand what they can be doing to create accountability in their organizations, and most importantly, use numbers to better manage the business. So check that out in the episode description. In addition to that, Some of the things that are family-related and so forth might be appropriate to mention here today, which is money management. It's a free course for individuals to just understand essentially what it is that they can be doing in their households to better run and manage finance. And then from that, it's a couples course as well that's included. That's basically going to fall into what we were discussing today is kind of like a family affirmation or family mission statement. So lots of things here that I think you'll actually benefit from as you take advantage of those to build for yourself 
both a professional and personal mindset, a, an affirmation, a, my, a, a, a mission statement as well. The other thing I'd like to point out is with this program, you could actually see the value of some of the consultative services, coaching type services that you can provide in a CFO and advisory capacity. In that sense, check out more information about becoming a profit and growth expert, as well as implementing the tools from the Universal Business Builder Program. So with all that being said, let me kind of summarize our conversation. Uh, this has been a great discussion. I knew with Mike that we would get into leadership and mission statements. Obviously, stepping in the, into the entrepreneur world, you need to have clarity of purpose, what it is that you're focusing on as an organization. And as he was sharing with his interviews as they related to Costco, when you have management stepping in that just doesn't have a clear understanding of the purpose of the business, how are they going to lead and keep everyone in line with what the goal is if they're un unclear as to what that is? And how can you, as you run your organizations, expect others to fall in line and kind of have that same mantra if you don't have that clarity as well. So creating a mission statement and building some affirmations is something I would highly recommend. The other thing that I thought was very helpful in our conversation today is the idea of asking questions, that as we're basically interacting with our employees and interacting even with our clients, it's not that we have all the right answers, but more importantly, we have the right questions, creating a safe environment for them so that we can have that exchange and they feel open and honest, and through that dialogue, actually allow them to come up with what they feel the solutions ought to be. So wonderful conversation as it related to that as well. So lots of little nuggets in today's conversation. Although not specifically accounting related, I do feel we got into that narrative of accounting is the language of business. It tells the story. You talked about key metrics. I mentioned leading uh, leading indicators that they are very relevant to what we're managing towards those key metrics. So lots of good little nuggets in this. What's a closing thought that you'd like to add? I think closing thought for me again would um, if you're if you're in a leadership role know and believe 100% whatever the company's mission statement is. Um, and if you don't know it, get curious. Um, find out how to build it. And if and if you can't find it, then you're probably working at the wrong place. <laughs> and and uh, understand what you stand for and, and how you can continue to just take care of others. And everything else after the fact will take care of itself. You know, that's a profound thing. If you don't have a mission statement, I dare say you just have a job. You don't have a purpose. Correct. So good, uh, a good little thing to end on there. So here's what I want to encourage each of you of my listeners to do. If, first of all, you haven't subscribed already to the podcast, definitely do so. Go ahead, like, subscribe, whatever it is in the platform you prefer. And in doing so, set the reminder so that you can get notified each and every week when we come out with a new episode as to its release. In addition, I would encourage you to go back and binge listen to the past episodes that we have of the more than 200 plus episodes, I'm sure you'll find various ones that are very appropriate and applicable to your situation as you're running your business that you can listen to and apply. You can also go to universalaccounting.com and in the navigation, find podcast highlights. We've literally taken and created playlists based on different themes that you can check out, whether they range from marketing, pricing, mental health, production, tech stacks, just a variety of playlists, hearing from the experts as to what it is that they feel are appropriate for you to be using as you're running your business. In addition, I want to invite you to GrowCon. GrowCon is an annual event for owners of bookkeeping, accounting, and tax businesses. It's a conference that you want to attend. Each and every year, we get the experts, put them on the stage, and hear from them as to what it is we ought to be doing as we're running our business. We also have there the peers, your people, that are basically also in your same situation running their companies, people you can interact with, collaborate with, and perhaps get some good connections and better service your clients as you collaborate on their needs. And then lastly, you have us here, the team of Universal Accounting. We're each committed to your success so that you can be in business for yourself and not by yourself with Universal. So come meet and enjoy and best and most importantly, make the best of that situation. Last thing I want to point out is if you have any interest in these different principles that we've brought up today, applying these or others from the previous podcast episodes, reach out to us. You can contact us at universalaccountingschool.com or call us at 801-265-3777. And always remember this, if it's about accounting, it is universal. Take care and be safe out there.